Hello, everybody. So glad you're here. I'm going to be talking today about benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. I've had it myself in the past, so kind of um, near and dear to my heart. But um, I've been here at PT at ACAC since our inception in 2004 and um, love what I do and love who I work with. And I have some great ladies in the room with me who are um, giving me lots of great support today as I talk to you. So um, I'm going to go ahead and have you do the screen share for me. Yeah. Um, find that on your computer. Mm. Thanks for coming, everybody. So I wanted to um, talk a little bit about um, some different things about BPPV. I feel like it's important to understand some of the anatomy that we're working with um, as we um, talk about this condition, because um, that makes a big difference with how we treat it and what we're doing in therapy. Um, so let's go ahead into the next slide. So anatomy of the, um, the ear. So you have the external part of the ear. You have the part that you see, the pinna and um, the external ear canal. And then we go into the middle ear where you can see um, the tympanic membrane, the three small bones in there that help with um, hearing. Remember um, back in the day, hammer, anvil, and stirrup, that's what we used to call it when I was in elementary school. Um, but the inner ear is our big focus for today. That's the part on the right side of the screen. Um, and that contains the key parts of the vestibular system, which are the semicircular canals, there's three of them, the vestibulocochlear nerve, and the otoliths, the utricle and the saccule. And so the inner ear is found in the petrous portion of the temporal bone of your skull, and it has four layers. It has the bony labyrinth, the paralymph fluid, um, the membranous labyrinth, and finally the endolymph, and I'm not going to give a quiz on any of that, um, so don't worry about that. So let's look a little closer though. So um, this is the inner ear um, anatomy. So we have three semicircular canals, so um, they sense angular acceleration and deceleration in three-dimensional space, such as moving the head on the body and turning the head um, or turning the body 360 degrees. So there's the posterior, the anterior, and the um, horizontal canals. And so um, the other part of the inner ear anatomy that's important for us to know about um, are the utricle and saccule. Those are the otoliths. And they sense linear, linear acceleration and deceleration, both vertically and horizontally. They also measure the position of the head with respect to gravity um, when the head is tilted. So when we look at the utricle and saccule, think about when you're on an airplane and the airplane's getting ready to take off and you have that sense of moving through space in a, in a quick acceleration forward. That is the utricle that's sensing that motion. Um, the saccule is, let's say you get on an elevator and you're feeling the elevator go up and down. That's the part of your inner ear that senses those movements. So let's get even more specific. And again, I'm not, there's no quiz at the end of this, so don't worry. Um, let's look at the hair cells and the cupula. So this is part, if you're going digging deep into the ampulla, the, um, the very middle section of, our, of your semicircular canals, this is where some of these structures are. Um, so if you, um, inside those canals and the otoliths, there are hair cells, which are sensory receptors that measure movement. These hair cells have one kinocilium, it's like the tallest fiber of that bunch. And then there's about 40 to 70 stereocilia that have a stair-step appearance. So in the semicircular canals, the hair cells are located in this bulbous enlargement called the ampulla. You can kind of see that orange kind of part in the center of the screen. Um, the hair cells and the supporting cells are covered by the cupula, which is kind of down on the um, lower left-hand portion of the screen, that blue part. Um, it's a gelatinous mass and the hair cells are activated by shearing forces of that endolymph fluid in, um, in the semicircular canals that acts on that cupula. So if they're deflected um, in a certain direction toward that tallest fiber, you're going to have an increased number of neurotransmitters that are released. If they're deflected away, you get kind of a turning off of the system. So if you look on the right side, that's in the otoliths, so in the utricle and saccule. And so um, this is the part where when people talk about the crystals in my ear or the rocks in my ear, that is coming from these two structures. And most of the time it's coming from the utricle that we're seeing um, those things um, come from. So, so if we're looking at that anatomy, um, if you look and you can see that there's hair cells in there that are sensing that movement, they're um, in that autolithic membrane. 
that gelatinous area. And then on the top are those otoconia or those rocks or crystals or whoever you want to call them. Um, and that's helping to um, give some um, kind of some pressure on top of that membrane to help it sense movement, um, especially that linear acceleration movement. All right, let's look at the next screen. So let's see how this works. So this is an example of um, a spinning position or rotation of the body. Um, and this would be sensed by your horizontal canals. And so um, with the skater at rest, you can see that um, that inner part of her inner ear, um, that cupula is just um, straight up, straight up and down. It's not being fired, it's just at rest. But as she starts rotating, you're gonna see that um, that fluid will kind of push that cupula over and she's going to sense that she's having that rotational uh, movement. Great, we're letting somebody in. So <laughs> no problem, you keep letting people in. I'm happy to have them come. So, um, all right, next slide. So now this is um, part of the otoliths, the utricle function. So we talked about, this is the part of your inner ear that's sensing that linear acceleration, and especially for the utricle, it's for like forward and back. Like, especially think of the airplane. Um, and that movement that you feel with that. So um, this, the utricle, it's linear acceleration as well as position of the head. So like if it's positioned in a tilted position for a period of time. So you can look at the gentleman on the, on the left, his head is upright, everything is kind of at rest, but as he's um, bending forward, you're gonna see that the weight of those crystals or those otoliths on the top of that membrane is kind of shearing that membrane forward and causing those hair cells to fire and helping the body to recognize, hey, there's movement, there's a change in position. So, so as I said, no quiz, but now that you understand a little bit more about the anatomy of the vestibular system, let's talk about benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. So, this is my dog, Daisy, and she will tell you that a vertigo is no fun <laughs> to have. So she's looking a little bit peaked there, but BPPV is an acronym for benign, which means malignant or not harmful. Paroxysmal, it comes on suddenly. Positional, it definitely occurs um, immediately following a change in position of the head. And then vertigo, which is that sensation of spinning. So vert true vertical isn't just like a little, imbalance feeling or a little bit of dizziness. It's definitely the room is spinning um, is the classic presentation. So let's look at some facts. So, um, so all of us have about a 2.4% lifetime chance or prevalence of getting BPPV. So, and so we have a 2.4% lifetime chance or prevalence of getting BPPV. So oftentimes it can occur spontaneously, just out of the blue. Um, can be common after head trauma, concussion, bumping your head on something, um, can be common after an inner ear infection. It um, can happen after um, a situation with ischemia or decreased blood flow in the distribution of the anterior vestibular artery. So maybe some people who have a mini stroke might end up um, with BPPV. It's definitely more common in older adults. And the reason I went through all the anatomy is that 90% involve the posterior canal. So there's not just a one and done type of treatment for this. There's different ways we treat depending on the canal, but 90% involve the posterior canal. So um, the things that I'll demonstrate later um, will just be for the posterior canal because that's the most common type. But two, two to three percent can involve the horizontal canals, and that's pretty rare in the anterior canal. So we don't really talk about that one too much. And then um, 90 percent of cases of BPPV resolve in two to um, one to three treatments um, if we can catch it early. But sometimes if people let it go on and on for two or three weeks, that takes a little bit longer to resolve. So what people see was that suddenly look at a sudden onset of vertigo when the head is moved. So commonly reported positional changes with that would be rolling over in bed. That's a very common thing that my patients will describe that I rolled over in bed and oh my gosh, I got all dizzy. Um, rinsing your hair in the shower where your hair, your head is kind of in an extended or a little bit rotated position. A bending over that can sometimes trigger some, um, some vertigo symptoms as well as um, any movements that combine like neck extension with rotation. So think about um, fixing the pipes under your kitchen sink or you're in this awkward position trying to um, clean something or get under your car, those kind of things. And then, you know, some people may complain of nausea, vomiting and imbalance as well, or just feel like they can't walk straight. 
So there's kind of two theories or two thoughts to explain BPPV. And um, these are kind of hard to say. So if I stumble, don't laugh at me. The cupulolithiasis is the first one. Thankfully, it's pretty rare, but it's where those rocks or their crystals, or those otoconia from the utricle um, are get lodged in the semicircular canal and they attach that cupula, you know, that gelatinous mass we talked about. And um, that you know it's responding to you know gravity with changes in head position. So as I said, that's a little more rare form of BPPV. The canalithiasis is the common one that we usually see, and that's where those crystals or those otoconia come from the utricle, and they head into that endolymph in this um, the semicircular canals. And so when the head is moved into that provoking position, that debris kind of moves into the lowest part of the canal. And then that kind of causes a change in that specific gravity of that fluid. And then it makes you think I'm moving when you're really not, it's just those crystals are in the wrong place. So what we'll see between these two types of BPPB with a cupulolithiasis, you'll see an immediate onset of vertigo when you move into that provoking position. And you're gonna see nystagmus and we're gonna, I'm gonna even show you some videos of what this is in a few minutes, but it's an involuntary oscillation or beating movement of the eyes that lasts as long as the complaint of vertigo. And then when you stay in that provoking position, that nystagmus and that vertigo will just keep on going. And um, it's thankfully, that's a least common form of vertigo, but it does occur. So I wanted to talk about that. Um, the more common one is the canalithiasis. So sometimes when I'm putting someone in a provoking position, which I'll show you in a little bit, you're gonna get like a few second delay of that onset of vertigo. Um, or dizziness when they're moved in that position. So it may be five to 10 seconds and suddenly they'll start having symptoms. Um, um, you can see nystagmus with that. Sometimes I'm just having a complaint of vertigo. Sometimes they have the eye movements and sometimes they have both. Um, you see all kinds of presentations with that. Um, but you'll have an increase in symptoms followed by a decrease in symptoms and then stopping of symptoms within 60 seconds. So the difference between the two is that with the cupulolithiasis, it just keeps on going as long as you're in that position. Um, with the canalithiasis, um, it's, it usually stops within about a minute. So what do we look for? Someone, when someone comes in um, with a diagnosis on their um, script from the MD for BPPV or vertigo, we're, we're not just looking, we're not just taking you right into the Dix Hall Pike and doing the epilee maneuver. We're looking at some different things as well to make sure that it's actually true vertigo and not some other issue going on. So we'll be looking at some ocular motor testing. You know, when you go to the doctor and they're having you look from the pen to the nose and looking at your eye tracking, those are some things we may be doing with you. Um, I'm looking oftentimes at balance and functional testing, maybe single leg balance, uh, Romberg testing, um, looking, maybe doing Berg balance scale, some different functional tests, just to see how are you moving? How are you, you know, how are you doing with turns? Those kind of things. Um, and then after we've kind of done some of that functional testing, then we will look at the Dix Hall Pike test for um, especially looking at that posterior canal. And we also, um, if I don't see any positive test with the Dix Hall Pike, then I'll start looking at horizontal canal testing. So one thing is also the reason why we look at that ocular motor testing, we're kind of looking a little bit at that vestibular ocular reflex. So we're kind of thinking about what's going on. Those eyes are kind of the window a little bit into the vestibular system. So that reflex is enabling clear vision through helping you stabilize your gaze, your, your sight, by coordinating eye movements with the movement of the head. So when we're turning to look and see if a car is coming, we wanna make sure our eyes are tracking with our head. We don't wanna have our eyes hanging out in one direction while we're moving our head a different direction. Um, and when we're testing for some of these things, we're doing it in the horizontal plane most of the time. Um, those semicircular canals are giving input to the brain um, which then gives neural input to the muscles surrounding our eyes to control the position of the eye in our eye socket and ensuring that clear vision. And so um, it's important. So sometimes um, with some of my patients, once the um, initial vertigo issues are, are finished, sometimes I'm working into doing gaze stabilization exercises or more balanced types of things with the patients. So again, as we were talking about with the eye testing, we're looking at lots of different things. I won't go into lots of details with this, but we may be looking at some of these different types of things to, and because that is indicative of um, some key results of these are indicative of um, BPPV. 
So eye movements that we're talking about, this nystagmus, this fancy word, is that rapid and voluntary eye movement. And um, we classify it according to the direction of that fast phase that's moving. So with um, the canalithiasis, that more common type of BPBB, we're looking at that latency. Okay, does it start, like, is it starting after a few seconds or is it starting right away? We're looking at how, what direction are the eyes beating in and how long are they beating for? And it can be different directions. Um, up beating like towards your, towards your hair or towards your forehead is more indicative of um, posterior canal issues. Down beating might be more indicative of um, anterior canal. Um, going to the sides is related to um, the horizontal canal. And so there's lots of detail here, but uh, again, um, if if those if that um, that eye oscillation and the vertigo as we're testing last less than 60 seconds, they're usually looking at a canalithiasis. But if it just keeps on going as we're testing you, it's more that cupulolithiasis. All right, so I keep talking about the Dix Hall Pike maneuver. So that is this this slide. Um, the classic way you'll see this, uh, this done is where um, people are in a long sitting position on the bed, and then we're gonna turn your head to one side or the other, and we're gonna drop you back into some extension, and we're gonna be staring at your eyes, so don't let that um, get you nervous, but it's important um, for us to be really looking for that nystagmus, as well as asking our patients, are you having any symptoms of vertigo or dizziness? And um, there's a lot of times when I'm doing this test and it's, it can be a negative test. So sometimes um, that BPPB can resolve by the time you get to see us, um, but we still wanna test this to make sure. And um, I'll demonstrate, um, when I demonstrate this in a few minutes with Amy, I'm, I actually modify this a little bit because most of the time um, when I'm first seeing a patient and they're just getting to know me, they're a little bit um, leery about letting me drop their head off the, off the end of the bed. So I'll show you the way I do it. That's a little more comfortable and easier on the neck. So I wanted to show a video, I'm hoping this will work. And if it doesn't, we'll, we'll move on. Um, but I wanted to show you, um, this is a test and this is um, a clinician, um, it's from the internet. I pulled this from the internet, but what I like about it, it you know, if you go to an ENT, um, oftentimes they'll be using these Frenzel lenses. It's almost like these, almost looks like swim goggles, but so they can see that your eye movement better. So. If you're, um, so just, to, I wanted to show you that I don't use Frenzel lenses here in the clinic, but, um, but if you go for some specific testing for BPPV or vertigo, you may um, have this happen. So um, they're gonna be doing the uh, Dix Hall Pike test. So I wanna show you that um, briefly here. So hopefully it'll roll for us. Yeah. And we'll see, it's loading. So there we go. There's no sound to this, but you can see she's turning the patient's head as the Frenzel lens is on, she's dropping her back into extension and that rotation, and then they're looking that for eye. that eye movement. So you can see how it's that not, there's not a showing. kind of a we're lateral not, movement. Not, yeah, it's kind of it's creepy. Not <laughs> we're not seeing it. See it? Oh, they're no. not seeing it. Oh, it's not you working. You have to choose working. a different screen to share. You can uh, shoot, screen. okay. Thank you for telling me. Yeah. I wonder, yeah, so we may not be able to show that one. So, well, I don't have to just show those. Choose another well. on the screen share. You just choose an, the other screen where it's showing. Okay, yeah, go ahead and stop that share. Whoops, we don't want that. <laughs> All right, Tim. Let's go back to, I don't have to show those videos. Those are not critical. So, so if we go back to, so, but I wonder if it, um, if it's loaded up on the, um, later, if we do it on the, um, if we load this up, they may be able to access it um, once it's recorded and they could probably look at it, so. Okay, I okay. mean, we can we can try and pull it up if you want, or do you want to just go? Um, I think it's okay. I'll just okay. roll with it. Okay. That's fine. It's no problem. Yeah. So, um, so what that's showing, and when we when um, when Angela um, puts it up to record it, you probably can actually um, look at that later and um, pull that up and um, see it. It's they're just quick clips, but it is kind of interesting to see what we're looking for with the eye movement. It's a very rapid kind of beating movement of the eye that, that we see with that. So, all right, so let's look at the roll test for horizontal canal. So um, the roll test is, so if I've done the Hedix Hall Pike, I've dropped someone back um, with their head extended on the bed and not seeing any response, any vertigo issues, then I, um, I'm checking for horizontal canal. So um, usually I'm having someone with a pillow under their head lying on the bed um, so their, their head is um, up at a 20 to 30 degree um, flexion level. 
And then we're having the patient quickly roll their head to one side and I'm looking at their eyes, checking for nystagmus, asking for any reports of vertigo. And then we're bringing their head back slowly to the center position and then I'll have them you know, move their head quickly, turn their head quickly toward the other side. And again, look for any eye movement issues or vertigo symptoms. And so I'm going to skip by these two, but these, I think once, if once we record it and put it up, I have a feeling you'll be able to access those, but we won't worry about those now. I will tell you a little bit about them. Um, so with, um, with the positive role test, you'll kind of see um, it's a doctor who's showing um, um, an older patient. And so as he um, turns her head to both sides, she does get some symptoms both sides, but there was one side that was more positive. So usually when we're seeing bilateral issues, we're usually just treating the more sensitive side or the, um, the side that has more, um, is more symptomatic. And then with the cupulolithiasis video that um, you can access later, hopefully, um, it's showing this as a young woman who literally has to sleep with her head in a certain position all night long because if she moves out of that position, she has um, constant vertigo. Um, so I feel a little bad for her, but thankfully um, that's pretty uncommon. Alrighty, so for treatment. So as we're treating um, posterior canal issues, um, which again are 90% of our um, of the BPV, BPPV that we see, um, sometimes people call this the Epley maneuver. I usually call it canal of three positioning because then it's kind of describing what I'm actually doing. And so um, you can see it'll start out with the person. Um, if you look at the kind of the graphic um, on the screen, they're starting out in the sitting position. And so if there are some, um, some crystals that are kind of out of place, so autolists that are kind of hanging out in the wrong place, they're kind of in the lower part of, of the canal. And so then we're dropping that patient back into that Dix Hall Pike position, kind of um, that rotated position, dropping them back on the bed. And you'll see um, in that, um, that middle graphic, you can kind of see there's like, almost like looks like dirt or something hanging out in the, um, in the canal. So that's, that's those crystals that are unfortunately in the wrong place and causing that patient to have some vertigo symptoms. So for treatment, we're trying to clear those out. So as we, so we stay in that position until the person stops having some dizziness um, issues or vertigo or nystagmus, and then we turn their head in 90 degrees to the opposite side, that's picture two. And you can see how it's kind of making as, as, the, as the, um, the head is positioning in different places, it's kind of putting that posterior canal in a different orientation and helping flush some of those, um, those autoliths out toward um, a different part of the canal. And then um, as uh, dizziness or nystagmus or vertigo um, goes away from that position, then we're actually turning all the way onto the side with the head kind of looking down toward the floor. And you can see that those um, crystals are moving into an even different portion of the canal. And then slowly we're having that person sit up with their head turned and then bringing their head back into that neutral position. So you can kind of see as you go through the graphic, it's kind of helping clear those, um, that debris out until um, it's out of the canal. So I have some patients who, you know, either that just is confusing to them to try to figure out all those different positions or maybe they have a real sensitive neck and um, it's painful for them to, get into those positions. So um, another option um, for, for treatment for the posterior canal would be these Brandt-Daroff habituation exercises. And so um, it's kind of a similar position to what you would do with some of um, the um, canal three positioning, but it's just um, sideline positions. And I'm gonna have Amy um, is gonna help me with this in a couple minutes and show you what this looks like for real. But um, you can see on the graphic on the left, um, you start with just sitting up and then you're kind of turning your head to one side and then dropping your body to that opposite side. Um, usually at when we do it with pillows because it's more comfortable in the neck. And then they're sitting back up again and they're dropping, you know, turning their head to the opposite way and dropping to the other side. Um, and then, you know, trying to, and then as you're doing this, you're, if it is causing some vertigo, you just kind of let the vertigo calm down um, before you get back up again and um, switch sides. And so with this, what's kind of nice about this, it's a little easier to do and you don't have to remember which side to go on and um, which way to turn. So a little easier way. And also with some of my patients, they just are sensitive to movement and have trouble with, um, you know, just moving in bed. And so this way, um, it's a little bit easier way to kind of get your body used to some of these movements that can trigger vertigo. 
So if you have a horizontal canal issue, this is um, a way we would treat that. So this woman, um, they have an arrow by, in the A box, they have an arrow by her left ear because we're saying that she has a positive left canalithiasis. So what's interesting about this, it almost looks like they're treating the wrong side, but in order to flush out with how the anatomy of the, um, the canal is, in order to flush those crystals out of that um, left um, horizontal canal, you're actually lying down on the right. And so you can see in, in picture B, she just lies straight down on her right side. Then after a couple of minutes, then we're turning her head. So she's kind of looking down toward the bed for a couple of minutes, she's staying there or until those symptoms resolve and then easing back up to a sitting position. So it's again, because it's a horizontal canal, we're kind of flushing those, um, that debris back toward um, the back of the canal. When I was doing some research, one um, kind of interesting thing so that I found was for like regular horizontal canal BPPV, there's an alternative to do forced prolonged positioning. And they found that like 90% of patients in this one study had a negative roll test um, within three days doing this. But most people can't sleep for 12 hours at a pop on one side. Um, but I wanted to show you this because I thought it was kind of an easy way to um, treat some horizontal canal BPPV. So um, the person would lie down on their back first and then they would roll toward that side that triggers their vertigo for about 30 to 60 seconds. And then they just roll toward their uninvolved side and they would sleep there for 12 hours. So most people have to get up and use the bathroom or something before 12 hours. But I wanted to show you this because it, you know, it can be a very effective way to treat that and it's pretty, um, pretty easy to do. So um, I just wanted to show you this very briefly. Um, so some, some of those, uh, that rare condition, that cupulolithiasis for the posterior canal, um, we have to kind of help you with this one because it's one that you would have trouble uh, working on yourself because it's a very quick maneuver. But again, it almost looks a little bit like the brant daroff habituation exercise, but it's a bit different because we're having to move you very quickly through a couple positions because essentially we're trying to, um, those, those crystals or those rocks or those autoliths have gotten stuck onto that cupula. And so we have to kind of knock them off. And so these movements are done very quickly and rapidly. Um, so usually if I were to do this in the clinic, I'd probably have myself and a staff member kind of helping with positioning my patient in order to do this. But um, so this is one you want, don't want to try to do at home by yourself, but there is, there is hope and there's treatment for um, this condition. All right, and then let's say someone has the cupulolithiasis of the horizontal canal. And like where you, they move into the, that provoking position and those symptoms just keep going and going and going. Um, this is what we can do is actually working on um, the habituation exercise where they start in the center with their head up on a pillow and then they're quickly rotating their head to the right, wait till symptoms resolve and they quickly rotate to the left wait till symptoms resolve and kind of, you know, again, habituating or getting the body used to going to those provoking positions to slowly work on um, alleviating those symptoms. Alrighty, so, so once we've treated you, let's say um, we bring you to the clinic and we do the candle three positioning, what do you do afterwards? Um, you'll see a plethora of different things on the internet, but what I found to be pretty effective is what I'm showing you here. So usually if I'm treating someone, they're feeling a little bit loopy, a little bit, you know, out of kilter because we just, you know, worked with them. And so I usually have them sit quietly for 20 minutes after the treatment maneuver, just in the treatment room. And I tell my patients to definitely keep your ears in line with your shoulders, like good anatomic position for the remainder of the day. You don't want to go bending over to pick up your purse or go scrub out the bathtub or something like that. You want to keep your your posture upright for the remainder of the day. And then when you sleep that night, sleep on a couple of pillows. Don't drop your head back into extension. Um, if you're continuing to have symptoms the next day, usually um, treat, I'm telling you what to do with that repositioning maneuver at home. You wanna do that in the morning and evening and then um, twice daily until those symptoms are gone. And then if that's difficult, you know, my patients where that's difficult for them to do because of um, neck issues, then we be having you do those brant daroff habituation exercises. Um, once the acute vertigo is gone, sometimes I'm needing to continue seeing my patients for either gaze stabilization work or a balance program. If they're continuing to feel a little bit off with their gait or feeling a little unbalanced, that, that can happen. Um, especially um, in some of my research, I was finding that sometimes people can have some residual dizziness even after we've um, done um, the BPPV treatment because if it's been a while, if that condition has been going on for a while, sometimes it just takes a bit longer for all those symptoms to resolve. And so 
that is not uncommon to have that happen, especially in older adults. Okay, we're ready for uh, for some demonstration. Are you ready, Amy? <laughs> okay, I'm gonna let, uh, let my wonderful camera woman get us ready. Let me get my mask back on. All right, so we'll use this for, so we'll use those in a minute. This is Amy. I'm very thankful for her helping me. Oh, there we go. <laughs> there we go. Uh, for helping me with this. So, um, and thankfully she doesn't have any vertigo, so I won't be triggering anything with her. So, um, what I'm doing is I'm going to show you the Dix Call Pike um, test first. So, I'm going to have Amy kind of bring, um, come up into long sitting positions. So you're going to kind of bring your legs up that way. And how I do this, I put a pillow here so they're not having to hang their head off the end of the bed. And I hope you all can hear me. I'll try to do my cheerleader voice. So good. I'm going to drop Amy back. I'm going to be looking at her eyes. So I'll tell her to kind of focus on a spot on the wall. And I'm just going to be kind of looking at her eyes, have her head in kind of rotated, extended position. And then um, let's say Amy says, oh my goodness, I'm having vertigo. And her eyes are showing some nystagmus. I would hold her here until things calm down. And then we would gently turn. And I would keep her here. And, let, and again, we kind of watch for that. We have her focus on a spot on the wall, let any nystagmus or any vertigo resolve. And then go ahead and bend up your knees. And then bring yourself all the way to your side. Great, she's such a great patient. <laughs> now we're gonna turn, you're gonna have your head turned this way. So again, I'm kind of supporting my patient or they can have their head supported on the bed as well. We'll stay here until symptoms resolve. And then I'm going to switch my hands a little bit here. And then I'm going to have you come up to sitting all the way. You're going to keep your head kind of turned to the side. So just come up to sitting. And then kind of letting things resolve. And then we're gently turning to the center. Good. And then, and then I would tell her, you know, wait for 20 minutes. I'm going to kind of have her sit in a chair quietly for 20 minutes. Sometimes people need some water, you know. <laughs> But that's the way to do it. I, I like doing it with the pillow here, kind of under the thoracic spine. So that way people can have their head um, resting on the bed. It makes it a little bit easier. So, so if that's not gonna work for somebody, let's say they have a lot of neck issues or it's really uncomfortable or they just feel nervous about that, um, I would have them do the Brandara habituation exercises. So Amy's gonna scooch over towards that middle section. And so you'll see as she does this, it's going to be a similar position to what people would do for um, a little bit for that um, treatment that we just did. So, so I'm going to have Amy start first with kind of turning your head toward me, good, and then you're going to lie down on that side. So keep your head turned, kind of, yep, like that. And then so she, I would have her like stay there, and she started getting a little bit of vertigo, I have her stay there until it kind of resolves some, and she's going to come back up to sitting. Good, and then opposite things, you're going to turn your head this way. And then lie on down toward this one. Yeah. Like that. Great. And then she would stay there for a little bit until symptoms resolved. And then she would come back up to sitting. Good. And she would just repeat that. And then as it gets less symptomatic, then you can pick up the speed of that. But you're trying to get your body used to that positioning change. Um, great. Thank you so much. <laughs> what a great patient. So, so now I'll go ahead and take some questions. I'm gonna sit back down again and we're gonna get the computer back to a different orientation. Great, okay, so yeah, so the questions here, super. Awesome. Yeah, so that's great. So that's the first one, perfect, great. So this is Paul's question, what can cause dizziness um, in addition to ear infections? So lots of different things. Um, one thing I'm finding with a lot of my patients, I see a lot of older adults and so, I'm finding that some people are on medications that can cause some dizziness. Um, sometimes they have other things going on, um, diabetes or um, vitamin D deficiency. There's lots of different things that can lead to some dizziness and imbalance. Um, people have had mini strokes, um, lots of different things. And so that's why, you know, sometimes we're testing for BPBV and we're not seeing a positive test. So then we have to kind of figure out, hey, is there some neuropathy going on in the feet leading to some imbalance or um, some other issues like that? Can it be related to apnea? Sorry. What was that? Can it be related to apnea? Hmm. It could be, maybe. I, I don't know that specifically, but to me, I think anytime you're not getting good sleep, um, I just think there's a lot of our systems that aren't um, going to function at optimal level. 
because then also I'm wondering too with the apnea, maybe it could be even a position of your head. Maybe that's leading to some um, issues. And especially as all of us get older, um, you know, those, those crystals or those rocks in our ear, they're not like the nice smooth, like river stones that you see when you're 16. Some are more pitted or they're more, you know, can be a little more crusty looking. And so I think that also maybe is a trigger for why they can pop off and head into those canals. Okay, thank you. And then let me see, I'll keep on going, doing that. So like I said, just kind of pull this down. Okay, great. And then, um, yeah, so um, so BPBB, so this is Amy's question. Can it resolve on its own? Yes, I mean, I when I had it a few years ago, um, I, well, I tried to figure, you know, I, it was before I knew a lot about BPBB, so I kind of treated myself and went on the internet and figured out what to do, but um, it can resolve on its own, but then it also can come back. So especially in older adults, there's a, a kind of a, relatively not, I shouldn't say high recurrence rate, but it can come back. And so then you don't want to keep going through this again and again. You'd want to, um, some of my patients are just appreciative because I show them what to do. And then if it does come back, then they kind of know how to address it quickly. And especially with BPPV, um, the problem is, is that if you let it go too long, there's just a lot of, it just takes longer to get over and you're just kind of suffering for longer. And, and also too, then once it finally resolves, somewhat resolves, you can still have the, some of that residual dizziness that can hang around for a while and that's no fun. Um, so actually that was just what I was getting ready to write. So does your does this treatment actually um, also treat that residual dizziness? Cause that is what happens to me and it, la and yeah, it can last yeah. for so, months. Yeah, yeah. And, and that is not fully uncommon, um, especially if you've had like several you know, bouts of it or something. So, um, well, I think the key thing with the canal three positioning is that you're, if you're finding it's a positive test. So like if we're testing you, like we take you into that Dick's hall pike where we're dropping you back and you're getting a positive test, you're getting vertigo, you're having those eye movements. Well, then we need to be doing that treatment. But once that's kind of resolved, that may be more that you need to work on more like the habituation exercise, that Brant Daroff thing, or using, um, doing activities where you're kind of you know, doing some gaze stabilization, um, really working on making sure your eye um, is coordinating well with your head movements, um, working on just general balance kinds of things. And, you know, and also too, I think some of the patients when they've had some vertigo or some dizziness, it can be very anxiety producing. And so even just when we're keyed up and we're very anxious, that can even, you know, add into all of it too. And I've seen that some of my patients, I have to, we're doing some gait, um, and balance things and they get really keyed up and they start feeling dizzy. I said, okay, let's breathe. Let's go get some water. And then, then it's fine. And so I think, you know, it's an inner ear thing, but there's a lots of different th systems that can be affected by it. And, you know, it's scary when suddenly you feel like, oh, I'm feeling off kilter and that's a little alarming. And so, um, I don't know if that answer, does that answer your question or, okay, great. Anyone else have any, is that everybody's question? Great. Um, any other thoughts or questions or um, feedback <laughs> um, on this? I am I'm one of several people in my clinic group that treats BPBV. Pretty much, um, I checked around and there's we have at least one or two therapists at each of our clinics. That, well, except for our base clinic, we just do base stuff. But um, the Pantops Clinic, Crozet Clinic, and our downtown clinic, as well as um, um, here at Elmore Square, who um, we have therapists who do treat this. Um, um, and well, obviously it's several of us treat balance disorders, but especially the BPBV treatment. Um, there's, we have lots of different, you know, several different people in our practice who can treat this. So I'm not the only one. And um, I work with a great group of people. Um, we have, I think, what is it? Over 300 years of experience in our <laughs> clinic group. So um, lots of people even have a lot more experience than me. Um, but uh, so, you know, key thing I would say, a key take home and I would say is that we want to make sure that you're, um, if you suddenly are getting this, you know, vertigo, you know, sudden onset of vertigo, you don't want to wait around for too long because then sometimes then it can just last longer. So um, oftentimes some, I see a lot of Medicare patients. So sometimes you have to go to your doctor first before you see me. So there can be that little bit of a lag time, but try not to um, let it go too long. You know, if you're having these symptoms, definitely get it checked out early and get to see us. And, and you know, some of my patients um, give me the history where they've actually gone to the ER and to make sure they weren't having like a stroke or a mini stroke. And I think that's important, you know, especially if someone has risk factors for that, get that checked out first. If you have some serious cardiac disease or um, other like long-term health issues, diabetes, those kinds of things, you might want 
to get, you know, some of the medical side checked out first before you just assume, oh, it's just a regular BPPD situation. Are, are there, excuse me, are there yes. some, are there some preventive things that one can do? Preventive actions? For one this? Well, besides yeah, not get, yeah. Not, besides um, not, not getting old. Sometimes not. Sometimes it's just an yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, if yeah, if you have the elixir of life, I want to know about that. But um, you know, I think sometimes it's just it can just be an idiopathic thing. It's just one of those things. Like for me, um, you know, five years ago I had it and it just came. It was. You know, I I think I can put it back to trying a new exercise where my feet are up on the wall in this yoga position. I think I was just in this weird position that I don't normally do, but. But generally, sometimes no. Sometimes it's just you know you just try to do good, healthy things. And I think some health conditions, as I said, like low vitamin D level or diabetes, or some of these chronic health conditions, can just put you to be more susceptible to this kind of thing. But um, I think generally, you know, I think knowing what to look for and just trying to lead, you know lead a healthy life, trying to be active. Um, and even some people who have just long-term vestibular issues, we really encourage them to move because what happens is with the vestibular system, that inner ear, it can kind of get sensitized to the activity that you do. So if you think about, let's say someone has the flu and they're in bed for a week and you start getting up finally after having a week of the flu and you just feel like, bah, I just feel like I have no balance. I'm all over the place. Well, it's almost like the, the threshold or the gain of that inner ear has gotten a lot more sensitized. So any movement really triggers it off. And so we always say when people have some chronic issues with um, vertigo or dizziness or just imbalance, you want to keep moving in a safe way. You don't want to just stay too stationary. So, um, but no, there's not really anything to, because some of this, this just can be out of the blue at, at all different ages. It's more common in older adults, but it can, at any, people at any age can, can have BPPD. And yeah, you guys have such good questions. <laughs> I know it was really technical at the beginning of my talk, but I felt like, you know, to do this treatment, the key thing, another key thing to know too, is that there's a couple different common kinds of BPBB. More common is the posterior canal, but so one size doesn't fit all. So sometimes it's helpful, like, especially if you've never had this before um, and are, you know, having these issues, you want to make sure that we're kind of checking you out to help you know what the right treatment technique to do is. So um, just because you don't want to be doing the wrong one and then, you know, make it worse or trigger something um, that would not be good. So um, any other questions? I, I actually do have one other question. So oh, sure. in the positioning, um, how do you know which, if we're doing it ourselves, I reckon, how right. do we know which side to start on? Yeah. You said so, that you start on the opposite side to the um, one yeah. that you think is where the uh, sort of the problem is. Is that right. correct? Right. So, so if I'm testing, remember we, um, when I took Amy through that thing where um, I, she was sitting in a long sitting position I dropped her back and her head was kind of rotated and we dropped back into some extension and I was looking at her eyes and checking for signs of, you know, vertigo or dizziness. And so it's like, I took her back like that, like today I took her back and then she, you know, I just pretended she had symptoms, but she didn't have any symptoms. Well, that's not the side you want to treat. So, but then if you, so you sit back up again and normally we're doing this with you, but if you want to, if you've had this before and you're just kind of curious to see if you're positive, then um, you would go to the other side. So you would turn your head like, so if you'd already tried to the right and nothing happened, you could try turning to the left and dropping back and seeing boom, if suddenly, okay, that's my positive side. So you stay in that position, like with your head support, you stay in that position until hopefully those symptoms resolve within about 60 seconds. Then you're doing that half turn to the right and then staying there for a little while. And then you're turning towards your right side and staying there for a little while and then sitting up. So it is kind of like, if you discover that, okay, it's your left side is positive, then the treatment is kind of going toward the right to switch that. So, so if your quickly. left side is positive, you start with your head your left you, ear you, down well, or yeah, right you, you start with your head rotated the right in extension so okay. you're start i mean excuse me rotated the left so i'm, I'm left-handed so i'm always saying the wrong side so so if you like if i if you were checking this yourself and you were sitting up like that long sitting position you turn your head to the left and you dropped yourself back with your head supported behind there and whoa that was definitely symptomatic then 
you stay in that position until things calm down. And then you start turning your head to the right 90 degrees. And you're waiting there. And then you're rotating all the way to your right side. So yeah, it seems kind of opposite of what you would think to do, but that is the right way um, to do at least for this technique. Yeah. Thank you. Absolutely. So great. Any other thoughts? I, have, I do have one question. Um, do you, I think, yeah. Do you see any role in your experience where medications do help like meclizine, like to take it preventatively before doing any of this, or is that really not helpful? Yeah. So I'm glad you brought that up. That was one thing actually I wanted to mention. I think when you're in the acute phase of vertigo, like, okay, the room is spinning. I, uh, I, you know, lie down and I sit up and, oh my gosh, I just feel, I feel horrible. I have to crawl because the room is spinning. Meclizine can be really important. It's a C, it's a vestibular suppressant. And so just for the first few days, like when you're having an acute bad vertigo episode, I think that meclizine can be helpful. The problem um, with it is that sometimes people take it for too long. So it's a, a C, it's a vestibular suppressant. So it's kind of like, let's say you had um, an ankle sprain and you just kept taking ibuprofen for weeks and weeks. Well, that's not letting, you know, it's not good for long term. And so I think in the very acute phase where you're just feeling horrible and you need that, um, you need to, you know, just function and, you know, live, I think a few days is fine, but you want to eventually try to, within a week, you want to be getting off that just because it is a suppressant. So it's not letting your body compensate and kind of work through um, that condition. So does that help or um, it's not a, it's not a bad thing, but it's, I think it has its place, you know, it's kind of like a first aid kind of thing. Um, for, um, yes, thank you. Yeah. So no, I'm glad you mentioned that. I, that was one thing I was going to talk about. So you beat me to it. <laughs> so any other thoughts? You've been so great. Um, um, all righty. So I don't see any other questions. Do you? Okay. Let me yeah. sure. Okay. Good. All right. Well, thanks for coming, everybody. Appreciate it. And um, yeah. So we're thank here. You. So if you find you need our services, please. Uh, you know, come on. Um, I think with private health insurance, we can see you with direct access, but usually um, with Medicare, we do, it's required for, um, that we have to have a doctor's referral, but don't wait, you know, come, you know, get help. And cause I think the quicker we can work on this and get you um, treated, the, I think the quicker this can resolve and not become a long-term problem. So, all right, thanks again, everybody. Thank you. And the recording will be up and I can make some edits and help with that presenter view in the beginning. I do apologize. Um, she was just, you know, we we're trying to get the notes up as well, but thank you guys for being such a great audience and um, yeah. And do not hesitate to reach out to us anytime. Okay. Bye-bye.